As previously mentioned, I, I would say that, um, first of all, that the recurrence rate for children uh, who are, have siblings uh, with affected by autism spectrum disorders is, uh, just to put this into perspective, is 20 times higher than the general population risk. It's remarkably high. And so thinking about how to take advantage of that understanding and understanding what the risk is for this next generation is the topic of the talk. Just a disclosure of interest, uh, so no uh, stock equities to report, uh, industry consulting a little bit, uh, I have done in the past. I'll talk about uh, one of the instruments that we use to measure uh, autistic uh, liabilities as a uh, quantitative trade, as a partnership with Western Psychological Services, which has been really remarkable because it's allowed us to, to disseminate our methods and to uh, translate uh, these uh, measurement methods, which are very rapid and can reach large populations now into uh, translating to 30 foreign languages and, and, and able to be used very inexpensively around the world. Uh, so it's been a great partnership. Uh, and I get research support from NICHD and the Centers for Disease Control. And uh, I like to mention subsidies for clinical and hybrid, uh, clinical and research hybrid programs that we have at Children's Hospital and uh, that the state of Missouri and the, and the hospital has supported. Okay, so when and why are children with ASD born to the unaffected siblings of children with autism? And the first point is that most children with autism are born to parents who are not affected. We all know that. And some of the reasons why that happens from a genetic standpoint, if genetics are the cause for that individual's uh, autistic syndrome, is of course what has been described as de novo mutations. And those are responsible. These are germline mutations that are not in the parent's body, but are in the baby's body as a re result of a mutation in a sperm or egg cell. And that happens and, and causes maybe 10 or 20 percent of the cases of autism at this latest count are attributable to those. But certainly those wouldn't explain why autism is 20 times more recurrent uh, in a sibling because uh, those de novo mutations don't get past the sibling. So all of the action of the inheritance of autism of this really pronounced elevated risk is not in the realm of de novo mutations there's something else going on. And we also know that the way that things can be transmitted genetically is through recessive mutations, uh, which uh, one parent has one, the other parent has one, and a double recessive in a baby, that's another method. Another method is that the baby who has autism can just have a very unlucky combination of multiple genetic factors, some from mom, some from dad, and just have the wrong combination then to develop an autistic syndrome. We know that this particular scenario that's depicted on this slide where a grandbaby has autism and that baby's maternal uncle has autism, uh, we've, we've studied this in, in pedigree studies where it's been very crude because people haven't studied autism adults historically. But what we know from the registries, from uh, older genetic registries, is that happens at least five times higher than you would expect by chance in a population. And we think that that risk is even higher because the uncles are never really that well characterized with respect to autism. So trying to figure out what this risk is in the second generation is our, is our uh, task at hand. And I'm just going to talk about three things that I think can summarize the whole talk in just three ways. The first is that the, the, the type of uh, 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 what, what happens in the autistic syndrome, uh, aside from these, gen these specific mechanisms of transmission, are that there are three sort of curious aspects of the autistic syndrome that make this very important in how this gets transmitted. The first is that you can have just a little bit of autism. It's not an all or nothing thing. The second is that even when you do have a little bit of autism, you can hide it, and especially you can hide it if you're a female. And the third thing is that when you have uh, even variation within the normal range in the population, not having autism at all, just a little bit of variation one way or the other in autistic-like traits, those can amplify the effects of a mutation uh, dramatically. And so understanding which of the females and male children, the siblings of children with autism, might be amplifying these kinds of risk is the task that we're, we've set ourselves to. So uh, in this talk, it's, you have to remove your black and white colored glasses. You have to think in quantitative terms. And, uh, and the, the implications of doing that are that what we had originally thought was a clean, unaffected sibling might be an individual that has some degree of affectation that we just would miss if we see the world through black and white colored glasses. And so if we look 
at the more quantitative elements of the autistic syndrome, what can we find in terms of traces of liability that would be then markers of risk for the next generation that act, could be acted upon in terms of preconceptual, preconceptional uh, counseling and understanding of what those risks are and certainly uh, bringing to bear early intervention uh, uh, as soon as possible in the development of those young children. Okay, so uh, on, the, on the issue of the quantitative nature of uh, autistic uh, impairment in the population, these are general population plots and they represent the counting of autistic traits and symptoms in general populations, not affected individuals, just in general populations using three different methods. Uh, on the x-axis, the further you are to the right means the more autistic trait burden that you have. And what you notice immediately across these three plots is that autism is not an all or nothing thing. That there's not a big hump on the right hand side in each of those plots, but a smooth continuous distribution. This is the way autism is distributed in nature. And one of the interesting things about that is if you just decide where you want to put your line, who's affected, draw a line across that x-axis of these are the affected people, these are the unaffected, all you got to do is just nudge your line to the left a little bit and what happens is you dramatically increase the prevalence of the disease. So that's another thing about this and one of the other interesting things is that in terms of how inherited these are in the general population, these traits, they're just as inherited as autism itself. So those are very interesting clues about this condition. The second big uh, clue is about girl power and about this issue of, especially for girls, that you can hide the manifestation of inherited liability to the autistic syndrome. Why do we know that? First of all, we know it's common for boys with ASD to have affected maternal uncles. Secondly, most of the genetic risk that's been identified is not on sex chromosomes, even though we have a four to one sex ratio in autism. But all of the, the genetic, most of the genetic risk that we've I talked about in Jerry's talk and Jeremy's talk and, and Jackie's talk are on autosomes, non-sex chromosomes. And so something is happening to drive that four to one male to female ratio that's universally observed. And then finally, the unaffected sisters of children uh, with autism spectrum conditions uh, turn out to have early language problems that they eventually outgrow. And they have also subclinical burden, aggregation of autistic traits at rates of 10 times uh, more, more than other girls in the population. And so we know that in these families, something is recurring, something is aggregating, but it's not autism itself. In the Baby Siblings Research Consortium, a recent paper, this is a sort of a, 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 a kind of a variation on a, on a plot that was uh, published in a, a paper in 20, 2015 on the Baby Siblings Research Consortium, and it showed the trajectory of the children who, uh, the babies who grow up to have autism versus who don't have autism. And in the original paper, the lines were all the same size. And so the black lines are the boys, the red lines are the girls. And what you saw was that if you had autism or if you didn't have autism, boys and girls sort of ended up looking the same. The boys and the girls who had autism looked kind of the same and the girls and boys who didn't have autism looked the same. But what we did was we, we said, well, what if we you know, thickened the lines in proportion to how many were in each category? And what you see is that many more boys who are later born siblings of individuals with autism jump the tracks into the autism realm and very, very few girls make that jump into the autism realm. And we call that the female protective effect. And there's a great, great deal of evidence from these developmental studies that that's what's going on. So once upon a time, we also thought that if a child with autism had a rare de novo variant, that their sibling was off the hook because that was in just a bad luck mutation in that child's genome. But sibling studies uh, and, and subsequent sibling studies did not have we, were, we thought didn't have any uh, subsequent siblings wouldn't have any higher risk of having autism than other children in the population if, if child one had a de novo mutation because how could it happen in the next child? Well, that turns out to be not true. So when you look at quartets, when you look at siblings who are affected, concordantly affected with autism, it turns out that sometimes they have different mutations. That one has one de novo mutation, the other has not a, de no a separate de novo mutation, not the same mutation as their sibling. And so the question is, well, is that just bad luck? And when this paper was published, people talked about, oh, it was lightning strikes twice, and you know, two kids in the same family are unlucky enough. But this is a very common scenario. This happens a lot. And so what's being shared in those siblings who are concordant is not their mutation. It's their genetic background. Genetic background is being shared. And so genetic background can be just as potent or even more deleterious than rare mutations.
So a little quick uh, little primer on genetic background. Chapter one is that parents of children who have uh, autism spectrum disorders have higher loading for genetic background for autism that is traceable by their behavioral phenotypes. So these are the mothers and fathers of boys and girls with autism versus the mother and mothers and fathers of unaffected children in the Nurses Health II registry. And the mothers and fathers of the children with autism are just modestly shifted to the right, have a little bit more autistic trait burden. They are completely normal individuals, but they have more of these traits than the rest of the mothers and fathers. And if, it, if mother and father are unlucky enough both to be in the upper quartile for the distributions of these traits in the population, it doubles the risk of a full-blown uh, autism diagnosis in their son or daughter. And that coupling of mothers and fathers doesn't happen by chance. In other words, there is a tremendous uh, correlation call, uh, on the basis of preferential mate selection for people who are on one side of the of the, of the distribution, finding others in the distribution, and that this is something that doesn't happen by chance, but explains literally 10% of the decision making that goes on out there about selecting a mate, which is absolutely remarkable. And it, and it causes then an, ex, an accumulation of these types of traits across generations. The second part of this story is that when you have a mutation, someone uh, previously showed the 16P11.2 mutation, which is a very common liability for autism, usually a de novo mutation. But if you look at the outcome of a child with 16P11.2, what makes or breaks that child's outcome is genetic background. This is data from David Ledbetter and his group that shows in the upper right hand uh, plot that where a child falls on the broad spectrum, if they have the 16P11.2 mutation, can be traced back to the trait burden in their parents. And so that having that mutation shouldn't be thought of as causing autism or not causing autism. It operates on a genetic background to just move you a couple of standard deviations more severe based on the mean of your parents' liability. And your parents are in the normal range. So think about it. This implication of being somewhere within the normal range can either propel you into an autism diagnosis if you have this mutation, or it can protect you from the diagnosis if your parents have that kind of background that would otherwise not result in that mutation being so severe. So again, what if this is really that? And now that the glasses are off, what we want to do is ascertain subtle traits of parents, genotype whenever possible, get our minds around the information that we actually have in hand. We can ascertain quantitative traits in parents now. We can uh, ascertain genotypes, as Jerry was saying, for $1,000 you know, a, a genome. And so uh, when we can genotype, when we can ascertain subtle traits of parents, then we want to understand what is the magnitude of risk to a grandchild, essentially, a sibling, as a function of parental phenotype and parental genotype. Right now, we don't know what that risk is. We are estimating that it's at least five times higher than the general population risk. Uh, and, and, and which cases it's going to happen in, I think, is something that we may be able to predict. So ignorance about this uh, is no match for an army of grandmas. And so grandmas can help us to characterize not only their sons and daughters, but their grandchildren. They're very invested in their grandchildren. They're watching their grandchildren. They're interacting with their grandchildren. And they are good uh, raiders of their grandchildren's behavior. So this is a picture of Dr. Natasha Maris, who is a recipient of an Autism Science Foundation Fellowship uh, under my uh, mentorship, and started the Ian Ian National Volunteer Register, the Interactive Autism Network Volunteer Register, the Mothers and Grandmothers-to-be project. And in this way, she set up among the, in the Ian National Volunteer Register, uh, in essence, an automated method for having the families upload information about new grandchildren that are being born so that we can simply count as these, as these children are being brought into the world in this next generation that we have a method now uh, where uh, uh, online in this particular registry those children can be uh, ascertained and phenotyped uh, using methods that we develop not only to count a diagnosis of autism in the babies, but also clever methods that Dr. Maris contributed to where we can quantify just how much the babies early on are affected. And this is, at 18, this is a, a, a plot of a method that's used 
to count uh, symptoms in babies and to do it in a standardized way, not to just ask how is your baby's, your grandbaby's social behavior, but to show you a movie of a little girl who's extremely socially competent and say, okay, compare your grandchild to that kid and count the symptoms. And when you count the symptoms, you see the same thing that we saw in the general population, a bell curve of distribution of babies in the population. And you can't really see these statistics, but they mark out in a twin sample just how inherited these, this distribution is, as is autism itself, as is this particular distribution in the general population. The last point to make about this particular project is that we've just gone to the first set of a couple of hundred grandmothers. In Ian, there's about 600 girls now who out of uh, tens of thousands of families in the registry, but only about 600 of the girls of the unaffected sisters uh, and, and have grown up at this point to be uh, over the age of 21 and in kind of childbearing range. And so we wanted to pilot Natasha's method in a first set to see how it was working and how the uptake was for the grandmothers and so forth. And the long story short is that uh, uh, of, among those, uh, we only sampled uh, just a small number of them, but of the first 12 that came back, and so this is just you know kind of right off the press right now, and we're just getting started. But of the first 12 that came back, this was the this was the 12 grandbabies that sort of uh, came back in the data set. And uh, if that grandbaby was a boy, he had a 57% likelihood of having an autistic syndrome or suspected of autism. And if that baby was a girl, it was zero. And so uh, this is, you know, not to take these numbers in any way seriously as the actual prevalence estimates, but the idea is that the method is possible and that we will accumulate this kind of data and find out what those numbers really are in the end. In addition, finally, uh, and my uh, wonderful colleague, Dr. Clint, is sitting in the room here, we have wanted to think about other ways to phenotype these babies uh, uh, as they are uh, developed. And these uh, methods, this is a, a, a classic study that was uh, uh, originally conducted by Dr. Klin and his colleague Warren Jones when they were uh, at Yale and now at Emory. And I think many people in the room have seen this slide that depicts what happens when a child with autism versus a child unaffected by autism is watching a social uh, scene. And this is a moment in time when uh, most of the children who are typically developing are looking at a, uh, a scene where a little boy in that car right there is giving a little girl the death stare because she's opening and closing the door too many times and he's tired of it. And most of the typically developing children are riveted on that child's eyes. But the kids with autism are on the door handle. And as Dr. Clint and Jones have told us over and over again, this is one moment in time. This is a genetic li liability that's causing this bias in where those children's eyes are. But what it translates into is a complete change in what their life experience is. This is a great example of a gene environment correlation. And in that sense, intervention may depend on uncoupling gene environment correlations like this. And to take that further, we have collaborated, Dr. Clinton, Dr. Jones in our laboratory, have collaborated to do our old thing, which is to go back to the general population and ask, what's the distribution in the population for where do you put your eyes on a moment-to-moment -moment basis when you're a baby, when you're engaging the social world? And what we found in a twin study in the general population is that identical twins are identical in the proportion of time, not only the proportion of time they spend looking at eyes versus mouths versus objects, but in the moment-to-moment -moment sizing up of a social scene, the tracings are almost identical, and dizygotic twins are all over the place, meaning that this particular trait is under stringent genetic control and a major developmental player, as Clint and Jones showed, that this was something that could be traced all the way to the second month of life to predict autism among the families with background genetic risk for autism. There's a lot of normal babies in the population who are, you know, not spending a whole lot of time looking at eyes, but still ending up okay. And so we're wanting to know what is the other factor with which this developmental liability intersects in order to produce an autistic syndrome. And how can we get to that early? How can we intervene? How can we interrupt this genetic environmental correlation? So conclusions, the more you look, the more you see. Major transmission risk is now traceable in the adult siblings of ASD index cases, especially in the sisters. We don't yet know just how predictive the tracers are, but we're about to find out, and we're going to disseminate that as soon as we can. And preconceptual genetic counseling and first year of life intervention are on the horizon. So I'll just acknowledge this is a 
outside is a New York day. This is where I come from. This is a Missouri sunset. Uh, and acknowledging uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Natasha Maris, the fellow who uh, won this award for the Autism Science Foundation, the Autism Science Foundation for having the, the, the vision and the, and the goodness to, to fund this research, and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development who funded a subsequent project because in response to this one-year fellowship, we've now received five years of funding from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, a U.S. federal grant, to extend this project over the next five years. So thank you very much.